Hello and welcome to this space. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thanks so much for being here as we kick off the Global Open Education Week at CCC OER for 2022. Um, as many of you know, this week is a wonderful celebration of the core values of social justice by way of open education. And in many of our institutions, we might know this work it, specifically in the context of open educational resources or OERs, which are free and openly licensed course materials. But you'll find today and you've known throughout your experience that this work is more than just about free. It's about social justice, equity, inclusion, and it's about transformational leadership. So I will share with you what we're gonna cover during this hour long kickoff. I'll give you a brief overview of what CCC OER is. I'm gonna talk about the Global Open Education Week. And then we'll dive into the panel presentation and a Q&A session, which is the real treat of today for you. And then we'll conclude with some, of, some things you'll need to know and things like upcoming events and how to stay in the loop. CCC OER stands for the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. As you see on this map, we've got about 106 members spanning across 36 states. Uh, we're basically a community of practice for open education. We, we provide resources, we provide support, opportunities for collaboration, for learning, for planning, leading, and implementing successful uh, open educational programs at community and technical colleges, all in the name of student equity and student success. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a global celebration of the core values of open education. So this entire week throughout the world, higher ed institutions are carrying out their mission through relevant activities, events, and projects to share with the world. So please, please do take a look at the openeducationweek.org website and see what is out there and celebrate with us. On a related note, it is our 10 year anniversary of the global week long celebration. So this year's events and activities are even that much more special. Uh, this slide has some fun facts that you can share with your institution. So for instance, in the last 10 years through open ed week, over 73,000 people have attended events and engaged in activities from 192 countries and 34 languages. My, um, talk about the globalization of open education. And we've had more than 1,600 events with over 73,000 participants that I mentioned, sharing over 1,000 resources. So every contribution matters for sure. And I'm really happy to see the widespread um, work that is happening here. So we have quite the treat for you, as I mentioned. This kickoff presentation is an open education leadership. And these four colleagues of mine from across the US came to my mind immediately when planning for this uh, panel webinar. Um, before I ask the panels panelists to introduce themselves, I just wanna point out that if you want to follow us on Twitter, uh, I, I certainly have a, a Twitter handle, which is at the bottom, at Prof Hernandez 2 CCC OER also has a Twitter handle, which is at CCC OER. And if any of the panelists have Twitter handles that they want to share in the chat, please go right ahead. And, and for the rest of you, please um, tweet this live as we go. All right, so now on to introductions. And I like to go in the order of the headshots. Um, so I'd like to for each panelist to tell us their name, their institution, their title or their role at their institution, and how long you've been in the open education space. So I'm gonna start off with Tanja Connerly. Thank you very much, Shenta. Good morning or good afternoon to wherever you are. My name is Tanja Connerly. I am currently a full-time professor of sociology at San Jacinto College in Houston, Texas. And I have had the privilege and honor of being a part of the OER community for the last 10 years. Thank you, Tanja. Thank you for your contributions and thank you for being here. Next up is Rebecca Griffiths. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here this afternoon. Uh, I work with SRI International, which is a nonprofit research institute based in Menlo Park, though so I'm in Washington, DC. Uh, I've been working in the open education space actually for close to 20 years, um, but, but from a sort of unusual vantage point in the sense that I, 
I've been a researcher in this space and in the early days worked with a number of projects sort of helping to think about audience focus and dissemination and sustainable business plans. So I have worked in open education more as a partner and as a researcher, um, trying to take more of an objective stance than as an activist over all of this time, but it's been really exciting to see the evolution. Um, look forward to talking more about that. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for being here. And I appreciate your contributions from the vantage point that you just described. All right, so next up, Cynthia Oroso. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Orozco. I am a librarian at um, East Los Angeles College. And um, I've been working, I first was working in textbook affordability when I was at the California State University, Long Beach. Um, but it wasn't until I got to the community colleges in, a, in 2016, when I really started um, getting involved in open educational work. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. And thanks so much for being here. And we have Richard Sebastian. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm Richard Sebastian. I'm the Director of Open and Digital Learning at Achieving the Dream. Uh, we work, we're a nonprofit that works with community colleges across the country. And um, I've been working, when I came to the community colleges uh, in 2011 is really when I started uh, working in the field of open education. So about, about 10, 11 years now. Thank you, Richard. And thanks, thanks to you for being here as well. Thanks to all of our panelists again. Um, and as you can probably gather based off of where they are, where they sit in their specific spaces in open education, you see why they were the first, first four to come to mind. And I am Shinta Hernandez. I am the founding Dean of the Virtual Campus at Montgomery College in Montgomery County, Maryland. I also serve as the Vice President of Professional Development on the CCC OER Executive Council. And I'm happy to moderate this panel for you this uh, morning or afternoon. All right, so I am going to um, stop share because the way I'd like to, to handle this is when we get started, we are I have a series of questions that I will ask each of the panelists. And um, then for the audience members, just a few housekeeping, feel free to use the chat to put in your questions, to put in comments, to share some ideas. Um, we appreciate uh, the, the use of the chat bot during, during events like this. And then we'll allocate the last five to 10 minutes for a QA. and a And then I've got some concluding and closing remarks for all of us at the very end. All right, so let's get started. I'm really excited um, to talk with these four leaders in open education. So I'm actually gonna start off with Richard. Since Richard, you were the last to introduce, you'll be the first <laughs> to, to tell us. Um, talk to us about your journey in open education, where you started in the equity and inclusion work uh, to where you are today as an advocate and leader of open education. Yeah, um, you know, I think, uh, and this may be familiar to other folks, I, when I started um, working in open education uh, 11 years ago, I was really focused on uh, the affordability uh, around open, open educational materials, OER, and seeing um, access really broadly as uh, kind of a, a broad, you know, uh, item, item of act, equity for students. So work in the community colleges, certainly you see um, uh, students who struggled to, to, to pay for textbooks and um, it, sometimes it was, you know, it meant whether they could go to, to school or not. And so it wasn't, um, even with the, so uh, in 2016, I ran the OER degree initiatives, uh, which is a very large uh, grant building OER degrees out at uh, 38 colleges across the country. And we had some general framework for colleges that were grantees to um, carve out, uh, you know, space in these courses for, uh, for kind of a, you know, it wasn't very specific, but, you know, carve out kind of thinking about the students who most needed the courses and, and to try to accommodate those. And, and, you know, we didn't really provide a whole lot of uh, structure around that or ways to do that. And, and colleges are pretty challenged just building out these courses. And so, so it really wasn't until 2020, you know, with the, uh, with the murder of George Floyd and the reckoning that we were having as a country uh, that um, we really kind of shifted at ATD and <clears throat> think about OER as a, an opportunity to um, integrate it with our culturally responsive teaching work, which has been uh, led by Dr. Uh, Rwanda Garth McCullough at ADT, 
And so it's fairly recent to uh, the kind of way that we're, you know, really being intentional about uh, uh, kind of thinking about equity, thinking about racial equity, and how uh, open education really is an opportunity to um, specifically address that through classroom practice, um, through kind of uh, uh, thinking about students' backgrounds, thinking about their interests, right? And um, also thinking about ways that um, kind of structured uh, uh, racism within higher education needs to be dismantled in, in, in open education and, and, and other places as well. So, so really, the, you know, our current view is, is fairly recent, um, uh, although it's been a kind of a thread, a broader thread you know, throughout my work uh, since 2011. That's wonderful, Richard. Thank you for sharing us the, the evolution of your journey um, and, and particularly for emphasizing your work with Achieving the Dream, this community of practice, that, this network that has allowed for so many of the institutions who are members to, um, to benefit from, from being able to share with one another, to discuss, to implement together, because um, we all recognize that it's, it's, a, it's a large effort, it's a community effort. So thank you for that. Uh, Cynthia, I'd like to ask you that same question. Tell us about your journey in this equity and inclusion and open work that you're in. Sure. Um, I think I first heard about open education at a ALA, American Library Association, committee meeting. And I was just like, wow, that's cool. Hopefully that picks up. Um, so yeah, back in 2011, and then it wasn't till 2015 where I started getting into textbook affordability, but really... Um, wasn't focused on OER as much as, you know, buying um, eBooks for uh, the library and that kind of thing, um, but followed the, the movement pretty closely. And um, when I got to the community college in 2016, it really became apparent. Um, and I don't think it was, an, it, it was, it was apparent at the university, but I think because I work so closely with students at the community college, um, it's just so much more intimate um, so much more of an intimate space that I really started seeing how even a $50 textbook was just crushing to students. Um, and, you know, there's so many programs to help with tuition in the California community colleges, but, you know, the books would cost more than the actual courses. So actually, I know Suzanne Joaquin was, is here in the room from Butte College. I remember attending a, um, a workshop series that she led that was really, really great um, and started getting connected to other people in my state. I know Kelsey Smith is here too. We've worked a lot together um, and it just kind of took off. You know, it's such a great close community where I was just trying to get OER kind of started at my institution. Not started, you know, people have been doing this work for a long time before it was called OER, mostly mobilizing it. Um, and honestly, I, I always feel like a bit of an imposter in these leadership spaces because, you know, my institution is not as far along in OER and, and open education as other institutions. Um, it's definitely kind of a, an uphill battle sometimes, uh, but, you know, chipping away. Um, I, I know that a lot of times this type of work is slow work. You know, you want to see immediate, you want immediate gratification, but it takes, it could take some time and it takes the right set of conditions to happen. So, you know, uh, working slowly and, and, and getting there. And I loved how Shinta, you started the conversation talking about OER is more than free because, I am at a majority minority institution where most of our students are BIPOC. And um, usually, I mean, while free is really important for us, a lot of times the professors are saying the, the existing OER that are out there are not culturally relevant um, in our community. And so um, right now I'm really trying to push that, um, get people to know about that kind of aspect of open. It's like, we can really customize it to a hyper-local East Los Angeles context, which I'm really, really excited about. And that is one of the beauties of OER, right, Cynthia, that it's customizable. It's um, something that you can make personal, personable to our students, especially as we know representation matters for our students as they go navigate the, the walls of higher ed. And um, being able to provide them with different perspectives that is relevant to their own lived experiences is crucial. And I, you mentioned earlier um, that you don't, your institution may not be as far along as maybe some other ones. And I'm sure that there are a lot of uh, colleagues in this space right now who might be in a similar situation with their institution. So to hear what your contributions and how you've been able to lead the way will be really helpful. 
Thank you, Cynthia. All right, I'm going to go ask now Rebecca. I'm going to go in the order of the opposite order of the headshot introductions. So, Rebecca, I would like to, you to share with us um, your journey in this equity, inclusion, and open education space. Okay, well, I'll go back as I said a minute ago. I first got involved with open education back in the early 2000s when the movement was just getting started. And at that time, uh, I was at another organization called Ithaca SNR, um, which was partially um, founded with support from the Hewlett Foundation. And they were very eager for us to work with um, some of the OER projects they had been supporting to help them think about sustainability plans. And um, and so our, you know, our early work with a lot of projects was helping them to really think about who the audiences were that they were serving and what those audiences valued and where resources could come from when the primary value of what they were, benefit of what they were developing was being given away for free. And um, you know, I think that continues to be a challenge, um, but it's been, I think, remarkable how much the field has matured over the past two decades, where now you have really established um, programs like OpenStax, which have, I think, made a huge difference in terms of um, the, the, you know, the, the credibility of, of OER across a wide um, variety of educational settings um, and the ability to, to, um, you know, to generate resources and, and contributions from lots of different directions to support these. So I, you know, I think on that sort of supply side, there's been enormous evolution. I don't know how much of that has translated into the crowdsourced um, vision that the early proponents had in mind. I think you, you, there's there's probably a lot more diversity. So you have some really big established um, providers like OpenStax and others that are much more um, organic or, or um, uh, um, grassroots oriented. Um, another, I think, big evolution and, and maturation in the field is just in, in the research um, part that I work in, which is, you know, research in OER has always been challenging because it's, it describes a whole category of content. It's not a specific type of material or textbook or anything that you can sort of field a set of very structured tests to say whether or not it works. Um, so, you know, I think there's, it's been a, it's been a long-term challenge for, for, for myself and for other researchers in this space to define what it is that um, that we're studying when we try to, 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 to investigate what the impacts of open education are on institutions, on faculty, and on students, or what the benefits are for all of these constituencies. Um, but I, I, th I think there's been a lot of progress in this um, by defining open education in different ways. So with research, with, with Richard's organization, we, um, we did a large scale study of OER degrees and we defined that as a particular way of implementing OER across an institution through a pathway of courses. Um, and, and we're able to, uh, able to demonstrate the academic and economic benefits of those programs and institutions. Um, I've seen you know, many other researchers like David Wiley and um, go through the whole list, but there's a lot of researchers who've done really rigorous um, studies demonstrating the benefits of OER for students and looking and using, using innovative um, approaches like throughput for students and examining what the you know, credit accumulation is for students who take OER courses. Um, so that's another an important evolution in the field um, that it's been fun to be a part of. Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca, as you're telling us about your journey, also sharing with us from where you uh, sit in this in this world, the way that you've seen the open education uh, discipline or field evolve and mature, as you, as you had said, and, and for the specific examples that you've given. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Now, Tanja, what about you? Tell us about your journey in this open work. Well, we know that OER is about sharing. So my journey has basically consisted of me receiving all of my knowledge and my leadership from collaborations. Um, in 2012, 
I was asked to pilot the Intro to Sociology textbook, um, OpenStax Intro to Sociology textbook. So I, as a faculty member, to me, once you receive a textbook, it's already outdated. So when I received um, the Intro to Sociology textbook, um, I, I just basically used it as a guide as I do with any other textbook. I really enjoy the simplicity of it. But most of all, I was just very intrigued by the point that my students didn't have to pay for a textbook. Um, that was 10 years ago. Uh, in 2016, uh, I partnered with Dr. Sebastian and I partnered with Rebecca and they most definitely opened my eyes to this institution of the OR community in which I have the privilege of representing today. Um, they literally brought our college, San Jacinto College into a whole nother era. Uh, within three years, we were able to save $3 million uh, for our students. Uh, I was able to, as a director of that Achieve the Dream grant, I was able to rally so many faculty members, uh, as well as our administrators in order to express how important um, this OER community is to our students since we are an HSI and Hispanic serving institution. Uh, in 2018, uh, I had the privilege of working with, I called him Batman, Dr. Nathan Smith. Uh, and we created what I am so proud to say, the Houston Area OER Consortium. This consortium consists of 15 area colleges and university in the Houston Galveston area. And we all have the same motive and the same goal is to eliminate the textbook cost for our students. So we meet and we congregate um, monthly in order to make sure that each one of these institutions are on the right path in order to receive this goal. Um, in 2020, I was asked to co-author the same textbook uh, that I piloted in 2012. So now I am so honored to say that I'm a part of the Intro to Sociology third edition collaboration as one of the co-authors for that textbook. Um, and then in 2021, I was asked to be a part of the um, CCC OER community as being the co-VP of the EDI, serving along with that, with Ursula Pikes. As I said, all of my journey is totally a partnership with some amazing people. And last but not least, I was just elected to the uh, board of directors for the Open Ed Conference. Um, Again, total partnership. I am um, so ecstatic, again, to be a part of, of this community and for you guys um, to ask me to, to, to basically state um, all the things that I've done in this community. But again, it's not me by myself. It's total collaboration because that's what OER is about, sharing. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Oh, thank you, Tanja, for sharing with us the work that you have done over the years, and we can see the direction that you're, you're going. Um, and what really just spoke to me as you were talking about your journey was the sharing part, part of the work, right? The networking part of the work, the collaboration, having um, shared goals, and then the process by which to get there is why it's so important to have these communities of practice, the ATD network, um, CCC OER, where we all get to gather in this space to learn and grow with one another. So all of that is, is crucial as we see the evolution. And I'm gonna, Rebecca, just steal your phrase, evolution and maturation of the open education space. Um, and, and so I appreciate all of your journeys and sharing it with us. So I wanna go uh, back to the, uh, the evolution and maturation of open ed. Um, Tanja, since you were the last person to talk, I'm just gonna ask, I'm gonna start off with you. How do you think it has impacted our, our students and our communities over time? Well, as I said before, that San Jacinto College is a uh, HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. So, and I also um, adjunct at an HBCU, Texas Southern University. So I have hands on experience in reference to teaching um, our minority population and literally understanding what their needs and wants is in order to be a successful member of society. So I can literally tell you that the, uh, the elimination or the reduced cost of a textbook 
really contributes to both of these communities, because again, this is extra funding that they can use for other things that are essential. Um, to the, and when I say essential, I mean food, shelter, and clothing, when I say essential. So these, they can contribute these fundings to other essential aspects of their life. So I really can understand about how important open education is to our Hispanic population, as well as our uh, African American population as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Tanja, for sharing that. Richard, what about you? You had mentioned earlier in your, as you were talking about your journey, the, the impact of uh, making college affordable through these open educational resources. As you've seen the nature of the work evolve and mature and grow, what are the impacts on students and communities that you've seen or heard? Yeah, I'll, I'll point to the work that we did with, with Rebecca and SRI on the OER degree initiative, which um, really was a, it was a very large study. And it also uh, included a, what we call the cost study, right? Of um, you know, what does it cost to implement these programs at colleges? And um, what, what are some of the uh, kind of costs and benefits of that? And one of the really interesting pieces of that was how um, this, you know, students in these OER degree pathways taking, you know, one or more uh, OER courses tended to, to like reinvest uh, uh, the, the savings uh, into, into their courses. Um, so I think we know from, you know, uh, students who uh, can take more credits and, you know, get more credits under their belt are more likely to, uh, to complete and get a credential. And so I think, you know, it really shows the um, impact uh, an institution can have by kind of investing in their faculty and in an OER in order to really have a very large and significant impact on, on all their students. I think we also um, at ATD see a really powerful um, intersection between uh, open content and uh, again, a culturally responsive teaching practice, which, which we also know, like when students see themselves in the, in the content in their courses, when they're allowed to be their full selves, when their you know, identities are uh, uh, kind of honored, you know, when there's a uh, kind of more uh, positive you know, language around being a student, uh, which you can do you know, with the open content, it's, uh, it allows faculty uh, to really customize and uh, personalize uh, their content and their teaching practices with the content, right, to make it more inviting and welcoming uh, to, to students. Uh, and, and I think I'm really excited about that because it's, you know, uh, you know we've talked about being, uh, you know, in this field for you know, two decades or you know, a decade or two decades, right? And I think the evolution is really getting to the, the real power of OER, which is that, that, that licensing piece, right, of being able to, um, you know, uh, make changes and revisions and sharing the content. And I think, um, I think that's ultimately to great benefit of the students, not just through like lowering costs, but, but actually um, building content and curriculum, right? That includes these students and that pays attention to them and, and really cares about them uh, succeeding. Um, so, you know, that's, that's I, guess, I guess that's what I see as the most important around that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I will appreciate the, the intersection, as you said earlier, of OER and culturally responsive teaching and what kind of impact that has on students in our communities. Um, Rebecca, since you worked closely with Richard on, on these various studies, did you also want to add any additional remarks about other benefits you've seen on students and, and others? Um, yeah, I, and I actually, I wanted to also respond to a question that uh, Rachel just raised in the chat about, um, uh, how supports for culturally responsive and open open um, instructional practices. So, uh, in a uh, more recent study that we've been working on with Achieving the Dream, we have been investigating or exploring um, what open and culturally responsive instructional practices look like in uh, community college settings. Um, so, we're really trying to dive into the classroom and get some insight into how these practices play out in, in, in practice. And um, as one, um, one of the products of this research is a framework that we've developed and Achieving the Dream, I think, is also in, in integrating into some of their programming that helps um, faculty and institutions sort of work through 
the different dimensions and components of, of courses that are open and culturally responsive. So courses that um, support student agency, that are inclusive, um, that, in, uh, that have a critical consciousness component, that foster a, um, uh, sort of a um, safe and um, um, you know, a community of care where students feel safe and accepted and, and, and um, as Richard said, feel, feel that they can bring their whole selves into their course. Um, so you know, in terms of the benefits for students, we have not yet had a chance to do a really large scale investigation into what this, how students experience these kinds of practices, but I can share that in the, we were able to do around 13 focus groups with students as part of this last study. Um, and they really do appreciate instructors' attention to you know, incorporating authors that are from backgrounds similar to students and to, to um, you know, having instructional materials where there's not a textbook that's kind of plunked in the middle of the course, like the embodiment of truth, but rather um, having access to, to a diverse range of resources that bring together different voices and different perspectives and, and, um, and, and feel more um, you know, inviting to students who, who want to engage with, with the, um, the materials and with the way that um, truths are presented. Um, so we've, we've gotten some insights into how students experience these courses. It's generally been really positive and um, I'm looking forward to our, sub, our next study where we, we can um, delve into those questions more deeply. Terrific. Thank you, Rebecca. And Richard just shared in the chat that the report that Rebecca is talking about, the study, will be released on April 21st at ATD's Teaching and Learning Institute. April is so far away, <laughs> says Robin. Well, and I, I, I'm grateful to hear of these focus groups of students and, and gathering some preliminary um, ideas of how it's going to impact students, but I imagine that the framework that ATD and SRI created, this the intersection of OER and, S and CRT is positively impacting the faculty, the educators who are likely thinking and, and, and rethinking and reevaluating their course curriculum or program curriculum to allow for those safe spaces, to allow for some critical conscious thinking, that community of care that you mentioned, Rebecca. So I can imagine um, the impact both short-term and long-term on the educators. All right, I want to ask Cynthia, um, from, from a librarian's perspective, Cynthia, what do you see as, as, the, as the evolution and maturation of the open education space? What do you see are the impacts on students and communities? Yeah, so I was trying to figure out how to succinctly <laughs> state this. Um, so I'll just start with my first open education conference. I think it was in 2018 in Anaheim. And um, it was great. Like it was my first open education conference. I was like, wow, there's a lot of things happening, but two things really struck me. And first, um, you know, as a woman of color, I just felt really out of place for, um, I just didn't see a lot of people like myself. And that was surprising, um, because that hasn't happened in a long time, especially in Southern California. And I also was just so confused because I said, this is equity work. Why aren't we talking more about equity and where are all the, the folks of color in this space? Um, so I think one of the biggest things like I've seen is just kind of the diversity of people and the diversity of thought that have entered the space. Um, when I first got into open education, I was a little, I was really into it, but a little concerned that there was a very, um, uh, there was a lot of open or nothing kind of narratives going around. Like everything has to be open. Open is always good. Um, and there weren't any, I mean, there was, there was, wasn't enough in my opinion, um, critical thought, um, conversation about, um, how open can reinscribe the inequities that we're trying to dismantle. Um, like for example, as a librarian, I have no problem with ZTC, um, zero textbook cost, um, instead of OER, because the student can still access the book for free, which is something like I will take ZTC, um, over, o you know, if, if like there's, if that's going to work. Um, I also think, you know, with a lot of faculty, um, you know, as a librarian, we, we kind of, um, have a lot of relationships with faculty and um, get to talk to them in really um, intimate ways about, you know, what, what they're thinking in terms of open education. Um, I was thinking, I took a, a class in art and my professor is amazing. He, um, at my college, and he um, has all his videos up online. They're not 
Creative Commons licensed, um, but I'm able to access them and this, the class can access them without having to log into Canvas, which is another barrier. And other people, non-ELAC people can also um, take his class, which is super cool. Um, but I think a lot of times artists get, you know, um, asked to do their work for free. And so obviously I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm not going to say to a photography professor, you know, make all your, your stuff free. And um, it's like, that's their livelihood. They make uh, money off of, of making art, making photographs, that kind of thing. The other thing I was thinking about is, um, again, not related to being a librarian, but I've been taking um, a Nahuatl class at UCLA. It's an um, indigenous language to Mexico and Central America. And I remember getting, you know, it doesn't have a standard textbook because it's not taught very um, in a lot of places. And um, I got PDFs of the textbook, a dictionary, all this stuff. And I was like, this is what I would pay $500 for. This is what I would totally, I would totally like support this as a, as a you know, GoFundMe or, or whatever to support indigenous communities in Mexico where the Institute is, is based. Um, so I think just being yeah, critical of open, not pushing open onto everybody. I don't think open is always the solution, um, I think is really, really important. And so I'm really glad to see um, that being contested. And then I think also I, um, uh, Rebecca had mentioned this, but I don't think that there is, you know, one universal truth. Um, I, I really kind of push back on that enlightenment thinking and um, want to see more um, pluriversality, more diverse perspectives. Like there's more than one form of knowledge in textbooks. And I think we're really starting to see that um, in really interesting ways. So that is my answer. Thank you, Cynthia. And I, I appreciate your saying, um, you know, let, let's be open about the work, right? Let's be open about the different perspectives as we uh, venture into this space. So many of us have shared goals. We have very overlapping values, and it's just a matter of how can we all get there in a space that is safe. Someone mentioned the chat, open um, does provide some safe, uh, safe space for all of us, um, but all the while making sure that our students are getting the high quality uh, learning that they all deserve. And so Cynthia, as you were talking about your, your perspectives here, I was thinking about the term decolonization, which many of you are familiar with. And if you're not, it's really this idea that we challenge what we have known for centuries, what we've been taught for centuries. We challenge it, we rethink it, we reevaluate, reassess, and we redo some of the things that we have been used to doing um, for so long and, and just moving in a direction where we can be more inclusive and more equity minded and, and include those voices that um, may not necessarily have been a prominent voice in, in, in the past. So, and thank Shinta, you. Can, I, can I just um, say like, I, I um, you're such a great moderator, so I apologize for cutting you off, but um, I like pluriversality is very much a decolonizing, like a decolonial language. Um, I tend not to say decolonizing just because you've seen that word get, you know, muddied a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to, to just reiterate what, you know, Shinto was saying about how this is a really intentional thing, like really um, disrupting coloniality, and um, it's not a synonym for EDI. Um, so I think decolonial work is really important, um, but I also just want everyone to be really cognizant of what that means and not use it willy nilly. I even like struggle with using the word decolonial sometimes where I'm like, is this decolonizing or is this just EDI? I don't know. I, I don't know if that that helps or anything, but I just wanted to put that out there. But it works because um, it, it works in the sense of you're giving us some food for thought. And that really is what Open Education Week is about. It's really learning things or relearning things and, and just having conversations that allow us to advance in the ways that we need to be advancing in higher education. So Cynthia, I appreciate that. Thank you. I have another question for each of our panelists. And that question is this. Um, I'm going to start with Tanja, if I may. What successes and challenges did you face or do you face in carrying out your leadership responsibilities within open education? Well, let's see. That's a good question. Um, the challenges. I'm going to say, I wouldn't, I'm going to rephrase that and say these are going to be new opportunities. Uh, my new opportunities that I will be experiencing um, 
is I am on the path and a mission ever since I, I think I met Richard and his group um, that even though I work for a Hispanic servant institution, that is my full-time job. My passion as an African-American woman is to make a huge change in my HBCUs. So my opportunity is that I would like to, and that's the reason why I started working part-time at Texas Southern University. Um, because when I first got involved in open, just like Cynthia said, it was, um, I didn't see many people of color. So I really started working heavily with Rice. And I told them from a perspective that as an African-American woman, that in order for you to come and tell me that here is a book that is saving my students, you know, an, a, an exorbitant amount of money, um, but you're a white person knocking on my door telling me that you're here to save me. And I'm like, I've never heard of this before. What do you, you know, what, what's the catch? So I have been partnering with Oprah Stack for a very long time to try to make a difference within that African-American community at my HBCUs going, no, this is true. We can save you this amount of money while you're attending college and make a huge difference and you're gonna receive the same education. So I want to partner with the faculty members at, um, they're gonna allow me this fall to, um, to utilize intro to sociology in my sociology course uh, at Texas Southern. So to me, that's just one step. I know that Dr. Robert Mel uh, Robbie Melton is working a lot with our HBCUs, but again, you, you tend to relate to people that have some familiarity or similarity to you. So for me to be a woman of color, to go and knock on the doors of the HBCU institutions, um, I think that they are much more welcoming. Uh, and so that is my plight, that is my opportunity, and that is going to be my mission for a very long time uh, to see what I can do in order to, um, to knock down some more doors and to make this community much more open uh, to people of color. Thank you. Thank you, Tanja. And, and, and um, for, for talking about the contributions in the HBCU space. And I, I especially liked the areas of opportunities that you have shared with us. So I am going to next ask Rebecca to share either successes or areas of opportunities for growth um, as you continue the work in this space? Um, well, I'll, I'll, so I'll share one of their observations from our most recent study, which was, as I said, um, trying to get more insight into the way that open and culturally responsive educational practices are playing out within classrooms. Um, one of our observations was that this work is really nascent in community colleges. Um, particularly at the institutional level. Um, so we had a very purposive approach to finding faculty. We were not looking for a kind of representative set of people using uh, faculty using OER. We were looking for, for uh, instructors who were really kind of pushing boundaries in terms of trying using, using OER materials to enable innovative teaching practices and then to, to try to understand what those are. Um, and what we found was that the, we, we did, we did uh, get to work with a number of faculty who were doing really innovative, exciting things in their classrooms, but they're, they're very much sort of individual heroes working somewhat in disconnected, um, in disconnected settings. And I'm not going to say that I think, you know, Montgomery College is, is an exception, um, Pima Online um, College, I think, has more of an institutional movement towards open pedagogy and open educational practices. Um, but in a lot of cases, you know, there, there, were, there were pretty established institutional supports and programs to support OER. Um, so faculty can get stipends, they can get release time. Um, there were, you know, there are efforts where faculty can collaborate to redesign courses, um, but we did not yet see that sort of structured approach to supporting transformation of instructional practices using OER. Um, so those still tended to be, um, you know, some, some teaching and learning centers might 
embed some innovative teaching practices that use OER in their programs, but those were not generally the focus and there's not sort of an organized effort to do that or a kind of um, consistent or coherent approach to supporting open, open and culturally responsive teaching practices. Um, so that's one direction that I think um, there is room for growth and that's you know, part of what we're hoping to support with the, um, the resources we've developed. Wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. And, and yeah, that structured approach, it's, it's something that I think so many of us can relate to, wanting and needing a place where we can come together and work together institutionally towards our shared goals. Um, certainly one of the things that we've done at Montgomery College, you mentioned Rebecca Montgomery College, um, having open education sprinkled heavily throughout our institutional strategic plans has helped a great deal because that has allowed for there to be the, the resources, the support, the infrastructure needed to get us to where we are today. And it's taken time. It's not something that happened overnight. It's taken a lot of time and leadership support. So that's certainly one of many ways in which an institution can, it can move in that direction. So thank you for, for sharing that, Rebecca. What about you, Richard? What are some of the successes or challenges slash areas of opportunities that you've experienced um, in this work? Yeah, I guess, I guess I'll build on what you just said. We've seen um, that when you can get uh, institutional support or a system behind these initiatives, you can really have a huge impact. And we've seen over the years with New York State uh, investing lots of money in OER programs so that uh, you could you know, hit a lot of the colleges and faculty that wanted to do this work and, and begin to really scale it in California, you know, recently just uh, infused billions of dollars into their OER program um, policies. You know, it, it, that's where I've, I think I've seen the most, you know, uh, significant change um, and success with, um, you know, it certainly has built out of faculty kind of grassroots, you know, work and interest uh, but when you can connect that with policymakers and kind of systems and uh, policies themselves, um, it's you know it's a it's a it's a game changer uh, for a lot of a lot of students. Um, the I, I think on the the, the challenge that, that I see is um, it gets back to I think Cynthia mentioned this kind of intentionality, right? And and that. Um, I think we haven't yet quite grappled with how the kind of open context, open content, open textbooks can really change the model of, of how we deliver instruction. Um, so uh, I think we're still in this process of kind of replicating the kind of textbook process, right? And so almost, you know, to an institution where you faculty put work and they develop their OER and they replace their, uh, you know, expensive textbooks. But I think there's an opportunity really to uh, begin to collaborate more you know, between faculty, among institutions, to think about how, you know, the, how faculty should be involved and compensated in this work, how institutions can invest in this work, because we see the benefits, right? We see that students reinvest the money into the, taking more courses, right? They save money. It's very, it's win, 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 right? Uh, all over it. So, it. so it makes sense to really think about how, uh, how these efforts can be supported at a, you know, significant scale by institutions. Uh, and, and then hopefully spread systemically um, uh, to whether it's a state or a region or kind of a system, you know, a system like in Virginia. And, and that makes me re re remind myself, um, Richard, after you made the comment about compensating and for faculty work, but also just supporting the faculty and the staff who are all engaged in this work. This is why organizations like Achieving the Dream, CCC OER, are also important, Open Education Global, because there at least a, there provides a, a platform that faculty and staff and administrators can use to see what others are doing and how can we do what X school is doing or what Y school is doing or modify a little bit to make it fit our needs. And so the, these um, exchange of ideas is, is so important as we try to, as many institutions try to, garner that um, widespread support for the work. So thank you, thank you, Richard. There's a question in the chat, but before I get to that question, let me conclude my series of questions by asking Cynthia, but same question, which is what are some of the successes or challenges slash areas of opportunities that um, you have witnessed that you would like to share with us? 
Yeah. So, um, I love that in, you know, we were talking about the evolution, the availability of, um, high quality OER is really, really helpful. Cause you know, at the beginning it was like, there's no OER, um, there's no high quality OER. So those arguments get harder to make every, um, each and every day. Um, I think one of the challenges at a community college is, um, certain disciplines like automotive technology just don't have, um, the really are kind of in a place still where like my campus really needs um, some kind of solution for those textbooks and programs. Um, so the career technical education programs, I think, um, still have a ways to go. Um, I also think that, you know, at first, one of our struggles was getting the campus to understand what open education is. And then, you know, tacking onto the conversation about labor, then it, right now, still it's um, administration saying, oh, OER is great. Um, go do OER. And it's like, no, 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 we really need an infrastructure for OER. We need people who are leading this. Um, I'm like a de facto OER librarian. I'm not even a real like appointed OER person. Um, we need infrastructure. We need funding. We need release time to really get the stuff going. We can't expect faculty to just make this happen. Um, although I think we all know that faculty are often asked to do <laughs> a lot with, with very little or nothing at all. Um, so that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, I also think, you know, Tanja, I think brought up the, you know, OER is, is sharing and it's absolutely true, but I think one of the things that a, a challenge is sometimes, um, there's like a, I don't know how to explain it. I should have probably thought about this ahead of time, but sometimes there's kind of like leadership, um, I don't know, grabs people are trying to get into OER, um, but don't, you know, recognize the work that's being done already or, or not kind of building a community. I think building community is such a great part of OER work. I love my OER colleagues, um, who I collaborate with. Um, it's, it's just an amazing community, but sometimes I think maybe people are trying to make a name for themselves or try to get a sweet OER coordinator position with release time, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it's really, really important to recognize the work that's been done um, before you come on and bring people um, in and not to be open, not to be, um, I don't know what the opposite, not closed, but yeah, just just being cool with other people. <laughs> And, and your point too, uh, that you made about recognizing the people, recognizing the work, that is so important because um, it helps um, emphasize the importance of the work. It helps emphasize the support that they're getting, but it goes back to having wider support, a wider platform on infrastructure that is needed to help really advance the work in the way that we need it to advance so that all of our students can benefit instead of just a selected few. So I want to um, just give a round of applause to our four panelists, Rebecca, Richard, Cynthia, and Tanja, for sharing so much of their insight on their leadership experiences and responsibilities, and just uh, being really frank and honest with us about the work that you've all have done in the last um, however many years you've all said in your introduction, and the work that you will continue to do as you move forward in helping us to, to sustain this work. I now wanna to go to the Q&A session and I do see that there is a question in the chat bot. I'm just gonna read it out loud and then anybody who would like to take a stab at it, go right ahead. So Robin is asking, do you find yourselves or coworkers struggling between wanting to promote OERs but also finding amazing courses and resources and wanting to take them only to realize there is no possible way to make time for all of them? I sometimes feel like a dog with someone holding a treat just out of reach and then remember, I'm supposed to be helping people find the resources, not selfishly chasing after them for myself. Who would like to answer that question? That's a, that's a, a big one to unpack, Robin. <laughs> And you're right about your question of there's just no time for everyone or no possible way to make time for all of them. Go ahead, Tanja. Um, I was just gonna, um, with all of um, the, um, the databases and the resources that, that, that is labeled, you know, OER and you're doing research and you find all this wonderful material. It is, and as a faculty member, 
you do find it very challenging when you're trying to assist someone or even for yourself doing research and trying to find um, the best resource in order to, to utilize, because again, there's just so much, you know, out there. And before you know it, it's like, you know, you pulled up, you know, so many, and it is kind of harder to, to narrow it down. So I really understand that part. Um, but the second, I'm just, I'm with her. That's a, that's a good question. Totally a good question. Totally with her. Totally with her on that. And Robin, you've given us a lot to think about during open ed week <laughs> this week. So Liz has just put into the chat the sh survey to, to tell us how um, what you thought of today's webinar. I just want to share real quick. I'm going to go back to share screen. So again, I thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here and for sharing your insight on leadership. Just a few concluding remarks on my end here. Um, just so that you know what else is going on this week, as soon as I, it allows me to move forward. Uh, the rest of our Open Ed Week um, panels, or webinars rather, sorry, are listed there. So there's another one tomorrow uh, on Arlo, and then another one on Wednesday on the Open Education Global um, Strategic Plan. And then we proceed with our monthly webinars, one in April, one in May. Um, and please sign up so you can register and get the Zoom link. The, the bit.ly is stated at the very bottom. We hope to see you all there. And then just a couple of different ways to stay in the loop here. Um, you can certainly go to our the CCC OER website and under the Get Involved tab or menu, you'll see all the upcoming conferences. You can also join by our community email and you can receive information that way. You can read or email student OER impact stories. And then as, as Liz had already put in the chat, please just take this short survey to let us know what you thought of today's um, webinar. And so she put that in the chat, so it's, it's there. And then just on, uh, just to conclude is our, the email addresses for the CCC OER staff. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Una Daly and Liz Yada will be more than happy to answer any and all questions. Thank you so much for being here as we kick off Global Open Education Week with CCC OER, and I hope to see all of you during the rest of the week. Have a good one, everyone.